Hi. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, well, good to be back uh, in the midst of physical events. Good to meet people, good to meet customers and partners. So, seems like good old times are back. My name is Avik, and I head a uh, strategic business for Aerospike uh, in Asia. And I have with me Kalpesh, uh, who is engineering manager at Ku. Uh, we will, the agenda for today is, uh, so Ku has been a customer of Aerospike, Aerospike's real-time data platform uh, hosted on AWS. And the agenda for today is, uh, Kalpesh will talk a bit about how they have built a personalization feed using Aerospike on AWS, followed by myself, uh, will take you through uh, who is Aerospike, basically, and, and where do we fit in. So with that, uh, I would like to hand over the floor to Kalpesh for the first session. Yeah, so hi everybody, I'm Kalpesh. I'm an engineering manager at Ku. So I majorly look out for the user feed and you know all the product requirements which comes day to day for you know if any architecture is required any solutioning is required so i'll be talking about how we have built a near real time personalized rank feed on ku and how aerospike and aws is helping us out so before that what's ku so ku is a truly indian microblogging platform where you can post your opinion, you can follow people, and you know you can do it in your own mother tongue. So that's the USP. So basically, you can do it in your own language. So we support couple of language. We support ten languages right now, and we will expand more as we'll grow as a community. So, so these are the top agenda for the today's presentation. So. We'll talk about what's cool top level use cases, what yeah, we are solving. Then we'll do a bit more uh, deep dive into the architectures for the rank feed, how we have done rank feed, how we make sure it's always, you know, you'll get the fresh content, you'll get the relevant content. And what we used to do before rank feed, how we have started when we just started the app and uh, why we chose Aerospike and uh, what are the small architectural details you need to be sure about before you know you do a data modeling or you know you put any use case over the Aerospike. And after pushing to the rank feed, what are the impacts we have seen in our matrices, how we have growth after, grow after that and the next set of challenges which we have set for us. So what Ku is solving? So India is a very diverse country, right? And like a lot of people, different cultures, different uh, languages. So basically Ku supports, Ku provides them a platform where, you know, they can express their own concerns which are coming in their society. And, you know, it, it gives you a very hyper-local environment around you. So, you know, if let's say a very good example is, let's say, IPS of Darbanga, a city in Bihar, right? He will not have that many followers on Twitter like he would have on Ku. Because his actual community, the people who wants to listen to him, they would be more on Ku. So this is basically the USP of the app, right? So it will connect you to the actual people you need. So it does the location, it takes the language, and language is a very important aspect for us. So basically, if we have to do any segmentation, we have to create any cohort, any classification, any uh, relevance, the first thing which comes into the picture is the language. So this is one more thing where we are different from any other social media app. You, if you have n number of users, your metrics would be on n, right? But here it's like x cross n, because we have to measure every user on every language. How well he's performing in English, how well he's performing in Hindi, have, shall I boost up in Hindi, shall I boost up in English? So these kind of things. So, like I told, like language is a very important aspect for all of us, right? So we need to identify the language in which the user is going. The user is posting the content before even it gets into the system, it gets into the pipeline. So we have some models which runs on top of some existential models because getting English language as a text is easy, but identify Hindi, Marathi, Tamil, Telugu, whether they have emojis, hashtags and all, right? It's kind of tough. So we have, we use some models and we have write some other models on top of those base models and that's how we are able to identify it. We also run some models to extract NERs, basically name entity recognition, so that you know we have more vectors for classification when we are going to put that into the system. Now after classification, right, the things which comes into the picture is the rank feed, because now the content is on the platform, now the thing which comes is basically the discovery. You have to put that plat content on a platform efficiently so that right users can con connect to it. Again, language will come as an important part. So how rank feed helps site? So what are the challenges which we face during the rank feed? So it's a classic fan out problem. Basically somebody is posting a content 
and now I have to push that content to everybody's feed who is following that user with the language cohort, right? So fan out is a classical problem which is there in any social media company. Then the second problem which comes is basically if you have a VIPs who have huge number of followers. We have Yogi Adityanath on our platform by the way. We have Piyush Goel, we have almost all the cabinet ministers and they have massive followers like 5 million, 7 million, 2 million, 3 million, right? So if they are posting anything and we just started doing fan out for them, it will take a lot of time. It can even, the freshness of the content will not be there the time it will reach to the user. So to handle all those things, we have done some architecture changes so that, you know, we can handle it properly. There is one more thing, yeah. So basically to handle the fan out efficiently, what we have done is we only do fan out for active users. Too much people, too many people are following any celebrity, but only few of them are active on the app. So instead of doing fan out for everybody, let's do fan out for only users who are active on the app. But this optimization has a cost in it. What if that user comes on the app after seven to eight days, right? So then if the user is opening the app, they will see the stale feed. That is not correct. We can't tell user you are not on the app, we are not showing you the content, right? So, and one more thing which is it, like it's very synchronous in nature. So what do I mean by synchronous? If you open any other social media app, right? You will open it, you will see a pop-up, new content. You click on it, then you will see the new content. Here, the moment user opens the app, it will automatically see a real-time feed. You don't have to wait a bit to get the asynchronous push-up. Okay, okay, now I have to click on this button and now I will to see my feed. Okay, because again, this app is basically for your tier two, tier three people, mostly, right now. So they are not that educated. So we have to serve them in the near real time. So key architecture goals when you create a rank feed, right? So timeline feed is more or less easy. Everybody has cracked it out by doing separate fan out for VIPs, like just keep them in a separate cache and doing normal fan out for people who have less number of followers. But you have to maintain the aesthetics of your rank feed. What do I mean by that is, there are, I'll give you an example. So there are two type of users on this system. User A who comes once in a day or after two time, two days in once, right? Then there would be some users who comes every five, six hours. You know, they'll keep on opening the app, scrolling the app, right? So for user of type A, you can't push the content who is, which is relevant to it just because it's a bit old. User is seeing the late, right? And user who is frequently opening the app, you have to make sure that he'll get the fresh content all the time. Otherwise, it will be a stale feed for that user, right? So that's one challenge which we have to solve. And you can say it as a blessing in disguise by putting this problem in the mind, right? Putting this as a base problem, we architect our feed ranking such a way that we were able to actually deliver it quite fast. I'll explain more about it when we'll go into the more architecture details. So what are the basic, uh, you know, major cohorts where we see, say, okay, these are the weightages for our algorithmic feeds because now we need inputs to, you know, assign those weightages to those content. So what we have done is uh, there are two major attributes in our system. Basically, first is user, second one is content. So what do I mean by user? So let's say I am from Kota, Rajasthan, a Hindi speaking purpose, interested in cricket. Somebody else is from some other region, speaks some other language, interested in politics, interested in entertainment and other stuff. Sorry. So when whenever I'm following anybody, right? So my weightage towards that creator will change according to my interest, right? So that's where this affinity score comes into the picture. So affinity score, it's actually very hard to maintain because it, again, it's a N cross N matrix. It has to be on a user and creator level. So we have our data engineering teams has created some pipelines so that, you know, we can put that in aerospike in a real time fashion and we can serve it in a very low latency IO through a key value fetch. Okay, so everything when you designing a rank feed kind of a system, right? Everything has to be a key value and everything has to be a pre-computed. You can't compute things on the fly if you don't have your raw signals on before pre-computedly, right? So this is basically the people and then comes the content, actual content. Do I like images more? Do I like video more? I am interested in GIF, right? I am interested in memes. And let's say there are some content which are actually trending on the app. Somebody said something getting a huge number of spike, right? Shall I boost that content up on the top for that user so that they can see? So these are the key attributes which we take while we generate a rank feed for a user actually. Yeah, so this is our basically 
uh, feed our ranking system on a very high level, okay? Like everything has a lot of detail into it. I can put that up. So, okay. So, these triggers and signals are basically all the kind of activities which users can run on the app. They can post a content, they can react to any content, they can just view that content, right? So, for those things, we have different kind of receiver microservices in place which are hosted on EKS, Kubernetes pods. So, they'll take those signals and then they'll push it to some pipelines. Could be uh, Amazon MSK, could be SQS, right? Then we have some aggregator services, which, you know, which will window them, club them, and, you know, put the raw signals into the arrow spike. Now, there could be some places where we need some extra information associated it so that we can put them as a proper key value structure into the place. So, for that, we use Aurora Postgres SQL. So, we, that this aggregator service will fetch those data from the main source of truth, pre-compute it and put it into the arrow spike as a raw signal. So, our timeline feed. Timeline feed is basically the chronological order in which feed is getting created. If four, you are following four people, four people have created codes in five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes, you will open the app, you will see five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes. There is no personalization over there. So, those kind of signals are stored in the, is a raw data signals in Aerospike. Now, when an actual user is coming on the app for watching the feed, right? So, our feed microservice will call our ranker microservice. The ranker microservice will get all those raw data signals in the, from the Aerospike. So, hardly we have signals like on a user level, on a cool level, post content level, on a user and creator level. So, these kind of sets we have created in Aerospike so that we can fetch them on a key value basis, get those data, compute them in the application and then create the cool ranking and store into the rank feed. So, this is our rank feed. So, the difference between this Aerospike and this Aerospike is basically this is a all in memory namespace. This is a disk mem with disk namespace. So, I will explain more about this. And then once the ranker says, ki, okay, I have done my job, the feed will just go and display this data. So, this is how I am achieving it on a near real time. There is no asynchronous thing over here. And this all happens in when, the, when you just open the app. So, that is the USP of it. Yeah. So, how AWS is supporting us, right? So, all our services are deployed on Kubernetes. Right? And we use Amazon EKS. So, we have a huge Amazon EKS cluster where we have different namespaces for ML, for data engineering, you know, for some CI CD pipelines, for actual application services. And again, we need auto scaling these days, right? Because you never know when you are getting a sudden spike. Let's say some politician came on the app and he just posted something and now he's getting a lot of traction. His coup is getting shared across all the platforms and now people are coming on the app watching it. We launched some campaign. Right? So, different services have different type of auto scaling. Let's say there are some services which needs auto scaling based on the CPU. If I am burning more CPU, I need more pods. If I am getting more messages into my SQS, in my topics, in my MSKs, I need more pods. So, we have configured all of those. Again, Amazon Aurora Postgres SQL, it helps a lot for, you know, high read throughput. It's massive. So, you know, you can spawn up n number of feeders parallelly and you have auto scaling policies on those also and you know your read throughput is done. So, the only thing which we need to care about is how we are pushing data into this Aurora, right? Because there is only one master. But you can handle very good high reads. So, even if your query is a little bit slow because it is doing a scan job or something, you can still use Aurora. You just deploy more number of readers. It would be a little bit on the cost side, but you can able to handle it. So, again, the streaming system is totally on Amazon MSK and Amazon SQS since we, to we totally is on Amazon, right? Our whole ecosystem works on the AWS infra. So, that's basically it's very compatible for all, all the services. And then we use S3 very heavily, actually. So, we use S3 for two purposes. One for serving all the medias, all the videos, images, GIFs. Of course, we have CDN on top of it. We use CloudFront. We use some other CDNs also. The second part where we just started using S3 is a data lake. So, what we are doing in any data change capture which is happening on the main DB on any application, we just putting it, dumping that signal into MSK and then there is an auto connector which is coming via Kafka and is jumping into the S3. Now, anybody who needs, okay, I need these many data viz, these many data set is my of use case. They can go to the S3, create a glue job, create a streaming job and dump it to their OLAP, OLTP platforms and they are done. So, this is how we are using S3. So, 
earlier when we just started, right, everybody was using our main database. So that was creating a kind of a choking for us because our application is also using and we are running some analytical queries also, right? So this is how we have segregated these things. Now we are growing up, so we can't afford, you know, any downtime on our databases. Any queries which are running as an analytical purpose and not on a user path, we can't afford to put them on our main system. So that's why we have started using S3 as a data lake. So this is this is Kuwa app actually, right? So uh, this these are three screen, screenshots which will so this one two three four are basically the components which are directly coming from Aerospike. So the first one is basically the generic feed structure. So what happens is if a user opens the app, the first I/O call will go to the Aerospike to get just the Kuwa IDs. You just give me the Kuwa IDs for this page. Then the second I/O call will go to the Aerospike again for getting the projection of those Kuwa IDs. What's the title? was the creator name, creator handle. So we have, we cache that also in Aerospec with Aurora as a source of truth in case of a miss. Then the second thing is topics. So like I said, right, we have uh, topics as of entity in the system where you can follow any topic, you can read about any topic. A topic could be a person, topic could be a entity. So Nathan Gadkari is the topic for us, one example. Yogi Adityanath is a topic for us, right? Technology is a topic for us. So. A core in your feed can be because of multiple reasons. It's not like I'm only following four people, that's why I'm getting the coups out of these four people. It's not like that. Because if you build system in that way, right, it's not, it's not a sustainable system because you will only follow those four people your lifetime. There is no discovery of it. So that's why we have introduced more features. So now he can check to the topics. If he can follow the topics, the topic coups will come into the feed. He can click on that topic he can see all other creators whom he is not following and you know they are going about the topic as a technology topic and he can follow more. The, sec the third one is, so we have a high, very high discovery rate from these nudges by the way, so this actually helps. The third one is justification text to surface out of network coups. So how many of you guys use LinkedIn? Like a very, yeah, cool, right? So in LinkedIn you would have seen ki, somebody supported this post, somebody liked this post. Even you are not following that creator, you are seeing that post, right? So that is nothing but out of network. So that's what makes your system as a self-sustainable cycle, right? There you don't have to interrupt between it. Now it's a network. You can follow other people. So that's where this out of network comes into the picture. So I don't follow this guy and let's say this content is coming in my feed. I'll be pissed off that why it's coming until unless I don't see okay, okay the person who I'm following has liked this post, right? It will create some, some anxiety against the user, okay, okay, why they are pushing this propaganda against my feed, right? So this is why this justification text is actually very important. So justification text, to maintain the justification text, right? So the problem is this justification text is not on a user level, it's on a user and cool level. So you can imagine the number of keys which we have in the system just to maintain this meta, okay, okay, this post is in the user feed because of this, this reason, right? So we only maintain it for the non-followings. We don't maintain it for the followings because you're following, that's why the content is coming up. So this is one optimization which we have done. Then again, the reactions. So basically the counter columns. So let's say somebody posted again anything and all the people are coming up and liking that post concurrently, right? So to, in, to keep that counter, right, we have to have a very high write throughput supported and have a heavy read throughput supported, right? So that's where Aerospec helps us actually because there is some concept about write post queue, I'll explain it later, which helps to, you know, to get this data more faster. Whenever you do a write, you can do a very quick read on those. Of course, we batch it but, uh, because you can get a hotkey error you, if you are doing it multiple, you know, writes on a single thing. But again, even if you batch it, right, when people comes on the platform and then they react concurrently because a new content will have more number of likes in the next 10 to 30 minutes. After that, it would be a stale content. So that number of likes won't be that much. But during the 30 minutes, you have to handle it up, right? You can't mess those numbers. Otherwise, those reactions are gone. The creator is unhappy, user is unhappy. So this is basically, these are the three sets which comprise of the rank feed actually, okay? So primary feed is basically your timeline feed, the chronological order. So right now we have three types of primary feed. One is I'm a user, 
I am following some people who are okay followers, right? Not too high. So whenever they are posting something, it's going in my content. Now I also follow Yogi Adityanath. I also follow Piyush Goyal, right? Now if they are going, I would be the system would be screwed if I am just keep on pushing that content to each and everybody. So how we have handled it? So what we do whenever any high profile user do a coup, we don't do fan out. What we do, we keep them in a store in a common storage. Okay, and whenever user is coming on the app to get the timeline feed, we do a KV merge sort. So basically we go, okay, this is my timeline feed from my normal followers. I follow 5 or 10 high profile users. So these are my 10 extra additional keys. And then I follow 5 and 10 topics. So these are my 10 additional keys. So 10 plus 10 plus 1. So you can assume it around 2021 20, key lookups happens on an aerospike in real time to get those coups do a KV merge algorithm because of the timeline thing everybody everything has to come in an order of that time it got created or it got reacted right and then we have to serve it so this is basically a timeline feed so I told like this post can come into a user feed due to multiple reason you're following the user you're following the topic now you're not following the user but you're following the reactor right that's where the secondary feed comes into the picture this is massive it's like totally a very very heavy set on the aerospike for us right because again if i we keep thousand coups for a user so for a single user it's a list of thousand coups then you transport it like this so it, it would be thousand keys for one user million users it could it would it is in billion actually so this is where we store the justification text then the rank feed comes into the picture so now if I'm going on my app and I'm asking for a rank feed, so why rank feed is efficient, I'll tell you why. Because it always works on the delta. So let's say I computed your rank feed at 5 p.m., right? Now you're opening the app at 6 p.m. So when I compute your rank feed at 5 p.m., I not only keep the rank feed, I also keep the last max element which I've computed from your timeline feed. So the next time when I'm going to ask for the more data from the timeline feed, I always ask for the delta. The coups which are in my timeline feed after 5 to 6 p.m. So that's why I always get a chunk. That's why it's very easy to, you know, do a computation on those set of coups and just put them on the top. And that's how you maintain the freshness and that's how you maintain the relevancy of the content. Yeah, so I'll be talking about how we started. So this was not from the day zero we had. We had a very plain, basic vanilla timeline feed. We just saw a video on YouTube and created our app. So if a user is doing a coup, just fan out in everybody's feed, right? The biggest problem is the high fan out because slowly people started getting followers, right? Now we were saying, okay, the latency of fan out, the time T1 it got created, the coup, and the time T2 it got in the last followers feed that has increased a lot, right? So this start, this created a problem for us and again the inactive user feed because we were not creating the real time feed for those users at that time so they were seeing the stale data they were raising complaints our ratings were going down so suffered a heavy loss for this architecture then why we chose aerospike so first thing aerospike gives is you the disk okay so user feed right that primary feed it uses a hybrid model so aerospike works in three type of uh, ways First is hybrid, where you keep data into the disk, but you keep the pointer of those attributes in a RAM. So if you're asking for somebody key, it will go to the RAM, get the pointer of the data, and go to the disk and fetch it, okay? Second one is all memory. Data is in the memory, pointer is in the memory. And third one is all flash. So we use hybrid and in memory both. So our rank feed is on in memory, and the hybrid one is and the prime timeline feed is in the hybrid namespace. So for us, basically SSDs are the new RAM because it's super fast. So we have 64 shards, 64 nodes of Redis cluster when before Aerospike. Now we just run on five nodes, that's it. And uh, three separate nodes for our secondary feed, that's it. So we are covering it up in eight nodes. Overall TCO is less, I'll tell you what's the problem. So we have a reactive framework in place so we are not we are a java shop by the way so we don't use normal spring boot framework actually there's a framework called spring web flux which is reactive in nature so it will never give you the object it will always give you the future instance of the object in mono and flux and you can use asynchronous operations on top of it very neat and clean it's like a node.js with java 
So whenever we used to, we have to see, okay, now we are going to get some scale. Let's say there is some Atmanabha Bharat competition challenge in which we are going, or let's say there is going to be some Yogi's PR or anything, right? So we have to scale up our system. So with Redis, right, what we have to do is we have to scale it up before the spike is going to hit us. And the problem is, single thread is a problem, anybody, any, everyone knows it. The, thing, the problem is with the horizontal auto scalability is need higher ops work. So even if you are adding, let's say, 10 shards in your Redis cluster, I have to restart all of my application just to acknowledge, just so that my client can acknowledge, ki, okay, now those new 10 shards have come into the system. Okay, and the second thing is, Second thing I'll explain a little bit later. So this was the problem with us. So this used to be a like three, four hours total DevOps activity. Just woke up in the night at 2 a.m., sit for 6 a.m., deploy everything again, set it up, and then go to sleep, and then wait for Spike to come in, right? So that was one thing. Now in Aerospike, you just add a node, wait for the migration to kick in. If you have a less throughput, there is also a parameter called migration threads. You can tweak that up. It will consume a little bit more CPU but you are able to do your migration quickly. Then customization namespace, I already told you guys, like you have a hybrid, you have a in-memory, you have a all flash, every, anything you can use according to your use case. So if you have use case where you have massive keys, right, massive keys, so I would suggest you guys can use all flash because your RAM will be wasted for no reason. Then in database filtering, so Aerospike is, just don't treat Aerospec as a key value storage is what I would suggest, okay? It's a typical NoSQL database, which you can use it NoSQL and provides you transaction on a record level also, which Redis cannot support. So, I told you, right, we use rank feed. So, we store two components whenever we compute a rank feed. We actually, the actual rank feed of the user and the variable from which we are going to do the next call. We do it in a transaction on Aerospec can never be happen on Redis because it would be two keys. Now it's one key with two bins. So that's the advantage which I which we got from Aerospec because then it will always be a dilemma ki hai. First IO call happens successfully, second IO call fail due to some reason. Now there is a functionality error in your system, right? User will again see some content. It can lead to some jumbling up, shuffling up in your feed. Now it's not there. So, and in database filtering for analytic purposes, like I said, don't treat it as a key value pair. You can have some secondary indexes also on some other bins. And you know, you can run some analytical queries on top of it and you can use it. I would suggest not to do this in your main cluster, but what you can have is a XDR setup, basically cross data replication, which Aerospec provides. And you can run anything you want on that database, right? Now the impact. So I don't know how many of you have worked or know about social media apps, but seeing a 20% spike in your reaction percentage is a huge win for us actually, when we launched our rank feed, right? And uh, again, so now we are able to see, we are able to push good content on top of it, so that's why my affinity with other users also increased, because I'm actually seeing the content, which I actually like. Right. Other, earlier it was like timeline, so let's say if you just followed any news channels, so what they used to do, they will programmatically call our create APIs and then 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m., they just pushed all the contents. So your whole feed will be flooded up with only one content. If you're opening the app at that time, you're screwed. You will not see anything. So obviously the good creators, now they are getting lost somewhere. You will not be able to see out of network because I'm reacting somewhere, I'm opening the feed sometime. So these are all the things which we have handled during rank feed. This, then all the other things are basically symptoms. One thing which we saw is basically our fan out. So the latency which I was talking about, right? By handling that high profile thing, and by handling this, uh, using putting on Aerospec, we have seen a massive drop in the latency, around 25, 35%. So before moving to Aerospike, right, this we learned very hard way. Uh, so always make sure how, how many keys you're going to put in your database. So what Aerospike does is, for every single key, does not matter the size of the key, it will occupy a 64 bytes of RAM in the arena, okay? So let's say your keys size is very small, but your number of keys is massive. So you will burn on the RAM. Your disk is very empty, but your RAM will be there. And if no RAM, Aerospike won't perform well. So you have to be very conscious about, okay, how am I modeling the data? So that's why I'm saying, ki just don't treat it as a key value store. I have two use cases, I'll create two keys. No, if the lookup is on a same entity, just create two bins. You will be saving two X, basically, right? So this is one good thing. But 
there is like there's a optimization in it you can't just create column in r because what happens it creates those pointers in the ram right so for every key it has to keep for all the bins it has to keep that many pointers so if you have five bins let's say five columns so there are five disk entries over there so it has to do five internal io to get those data to you back again so that's why you have to be very conscious about ki how many keys i am creating per key how many bins i am creating right and these are the next steps for us so basically we want to run some algorithms on the aerospec server rather than on our application then i told you right p2 p3 use cases are we are exploring all these solutions and knowledge graph by using some secondary indexes so yeah that's it i'll hand it over to avik thank you guys if you, if you have any question so aerospike provides you so there's a concept of data disaster recovery so in aerospike what you can do is you can attach evs volumes so what will happen it will first write to the nvmes and then it will write to the evs so let's say your server is getting down you boot it up again so your data will always be safe in the evs and then when your server is getting up it will first load from evs to the nvme and then it will reattach in the cluster and then the sharding balancing of the shards will happen so this is how we handle it Hi, it will be there. So we keep latest thousand content. So it's a LRU base. If after thousands, the first content is coming up to thousand, the last thousand content will be gone from the feed. So everything will be there in your rank feed. You can scroll it up again and again, no problem. We'll take Q and A at the end of this session. We'll have a separate slot for that. Right. So Aerospike. Uh, how many of you have heard about Aerospike? Anybody? Okay. So. That's something that we need to get better at in terms of marketing, right? So, uh, so who is Aerospike? Aerospike is a real-time data platform, right? Now, what's the problem that we solve in the market? Because every successful product needs to solve a persistent problem in the market, right? What's the problem we solve? We solve what we like to call as a right now problem. What's a right now problem? I'm sure all engineering managers, architects present in this room are facing what we call as a right now problem, where you have users using your app, who want everything now. However, your infrastructure is not architected to scale to that level, right? You have to take perfect, correct, futuristic decisions now. However, your data is not readily accessible to make those decisions. You need to have complex contextual information right now. You are again unable to process the data in real time. You have events which are triggering massive concurrency and you have to account for that peak load, but you're unable to save on cost. Your TCO is going out of hand. That is what we call as a right now problem. How do we solve the right now problem? These are the four hallmarks or arrow spike promises to every customer on four pillars on which arrow spike is built. Unlimited scale. We were founded in 2009 with a belief that data is going to be the new oil, and data is going to grow exponentially from an organizational standpoint to GBs, to terabytes, to petabytes, and so on. So right from the onset, when we started building a database, we want a database which can scale linearly and help you manage data as your data grows, right? Lowest latency. Okay, now one important thing to uh, understand over here, what we promise you is predictable performance. We have databases which can give you sporadic performance, right? So you have performance, you're, you're meeting your SLAs in terms of latency throughput, suddenly you see a dip in performance, right? So our, our promise is that we give you predictable throughput as you scale from GBs to TBs to petabyte. Lowest latency. So this is something which, is, which Aerospike was built on. Let's say if you are an example, if you are a an application to capital markets or trading, right from your first transaction to the transaction at the end of the day, you will get the same latency, same sub-millisecond latency. Uptime. We have customers running us for the last eight, 10 years without a single production level downtime. And we're talking about leading enterprise customers across the globe in the field of telcos, banks, 
ad tech, etc. We'll talk about our customer base a bit later in the presentation. And you get, get to do all this. You get all these promises at the lowest TCO, right? So these are four. So whatever we do in Aerospike, whatever innovation we do in Aerospike, whatever experimentation we do in Aerospike, these are four promises. We do not, do not deviate from these four promises. Now, how do we achieve this? We'll come to a bit uh, later, but, but first of all, a question to all of you. Do you have, I'm sure a lot of you or all of you would have these requirements where, as I said, you want predictable performance, which can be measured in single digit millisecond or even sub millisecond. You want reliability and availability for your uh, database. Your data is increasing, but you're not able to, your database is not able to keep up with that increase of data, both in terms of throughput or in terms of cost and TCO as well. Now, if you are, probably all of you have tried to solve this scalability, performance, or the right now problem with maybe one or a combination of all these factors, right? Traditional NoSQL databases, let's say in-memory databases, which are good in performance, lack consistency, data consistency. When you're running a distributed database across the globe, you are facing challenges of stale reads, of data consistency. High server count, RAM databases, as you grow from GBs to terabyte, your, your, your amount of servers goes out of hand. Manageability problem, cost problem, and tough to scale, of course. New age relational systems, low throughput, high latency, or traditional back office systems, of course, which are costly and which cannot reach today's internet level scale, right? So a lot of, a lot of you might have tried to solve this problem using one or more of this combination of technologies. I will skip this slide for a moment. Okay, how, how we help you with those four promises. These are some of the secret sauce, some of the secret ingredients on which Aerospike was built on. Our patented hybrid memory architecture. Right when we started in 2009, as I said, our founders believe that data will grow to such an extent that you will need DRAM-like performance, but you cannot bear the cost of DRAM, right? So, so we started experimenting on how we can get DRAM-like performance using SSDs, because if you use SSDs, it allows you to horizontally and vertically scale out as well, right? So the, the culmination of that is what we call as a patented hybrid memory architecture. We have 15 patents to our name on how we make use of SSDs to give you single digit millisecond latency, close to DRAM latency, uh, uh, performance. Our intelligent clients, which along with hybrid memory architecture, intelligent clients, on how, how we fetch the data, how the query reaches the database, how we fetch the data from the data, database, right? cross the center replication is our unique protocol for distributed database. You're running active active databases across the world, and you're replicating data in real time across databases. Cluster management. This goes into ensuring reliability most of our customers enjoy five nines of availability. I told you about customers who have been running Aerospike for about 10 years with a single production downtime. Strong consistency, very important. Most, so this has always been a debate between relational and non-relational databases where most non-relational databases, because to give you performance, trade off on strong consistency, right? Aerospike was initially built as an eventually consistent database, but then we also ventured into launching what we call as a strongly consistent aerospike mode as well. So we have customers, like in the ad tech space, the likes of Ku example, who run on our eventual consistency mode or what we call as our AP mode. We have customers in banks, telecoms, payment industries who cannot, who cannot trade off on consistency, who use a strong consistency mode. We are one of the very few NoSQL databases who has passed what is called as the Jepson test, which is, which is regarded as the gold standard uh, in data consistency. Let's take a look at uh, where do most of our customers use us in an architecture diagram, right? So this, let's say, is a typical architecture diagram which we usually deploy, right? So not sure will this work? Okay. Anyway, so. So let's say on the left hand side you have your clients coming in, you have your web application, mobile applications, and this is your 
legacy RDBMS or your cold or your single source of truth. Now, when you are building a database at the edge as a serving layer to serve data, you are typically or usually building an architecture where you have an operational database at the back and a caching layer in the front, right? That is what most of us do. Why do we need a caching layer and why do we need an operational database? Because caching layers are typically in-memory systems for transient data. You can't host more than a few hundred gigabytes of data in caching, right? So that is why you have an operational database. But operational database, as we, as we spoke, can, uh, cannot perform to the level of an in-memory database. That's why you're having a combination of cache and an operational database. What's the problem with this architecture? Multifold problems, right? So you're able to ensure and guarantee a SLA of performance as long as your data is getting fetched from the cache. The moment you have a cache miss, that is where you start spikes on your throughput and latency, right? You have to build complex logic on how you write data onto the cache and from there to the operational database or how you write data directly from operational database and how will the cache read the data from the operational database. What if the cache goes down? You have to rebuild the cache, right? And furthermore, in today's world, so this entire technology work, works well when you have some 10, 20, 30% of your data is hot data. But take the example of UPI, for example. Classic example where a lot of UPI providers in India launch, are, are implementing Aerospike. Why? Because using UPI is very difficult to determine which is hot data and which is cold data, right? Because all of us are making UPI transactions at the same point of time. Where does Aerospike fit in? Aerospike can combine that layer of caching and operational database into a single layer at the edge. Why? Because remember, we are SSD optimized. Because we are SSD optimized, we can play the role of an operational database. You can vertically and horizontally scale Aerospike. And we have been engineered to give you single digit millisecond latency or even below one millisecond latency. So you don't need the, uh, a requirement of a cache if you're putting your data on the edge on Aerospike. We have customers today, the likes of Airtel, for example, a referenceable customer. How many of you people use Airtel over here as, as your telecom provider? How many of you use the Airtel Thanks app, right? Whatever you see on the Airtel Thanks app comes from Aerospike. Whenever you call up an Airtel call center, the data is getting fetched from, uh, from Aerospike. Airtel stores all the static and dynamic attributes of the 350 million customers on Aerospike, where they run personalized recommendation and personalization. They have been running it for the last five years with no production downtime. This is one example. And, they, and this is something that they're running at the edge to continue the example. So three data centers in India where they're running Aerospike in a async manner using our XDR, or what we called as a cross data center application, 40 terabyte of data running on the edge on Aerospike getting single millisecond latency. That is where you see your Airtel thanks app. You pay your bills on Airtel. Whatever you do, it touches Aerospike. What a lot of our customers also started using Aerospike, which is typically relevant for the ad tech industry, is also to use Aerospike as a system of record, where you're pulling data from your edge database and storing it in another cluster of Aerospike, which is acting as a single source of truth. Again, using our async cross data center replication mechanism. Furthermore, we have customers, and I will talk about it in a, in a minute. We have, we have customers who are using Aerospike as a query and reporting tool, where you're pulling data from system of record. You're able to run SQL queries on Aerospike using our connectors, which I will talk in a minute, or running Spark jobs on Aerospike. The one at the top that you see is our latest uh, innovation, which we call as multi-site clustering, which means that in this, so, so let's say in this example where you are running three clusters in three geographically dispersed data centers, and you are asynchronously replicating data across three data centers. Multi-site clustering is a mode where you can run one single stretch cluster across multiple data centers in the world in a synchronous replication manner. Of course, there will be trade-off in latency, but this is something which currently, we can't reference our financial customers mostly. Currently, one of the top three private banks of India, one of the top 10 private banks of India, one of the top government bank of India 
are all deploying AeroSpike for mobile banking, net banking, UPI, using what we call as a multi-site clustering. A very high level, I won't go deep into it, we can set up further sessions. On a very high level, this is what our architecture is. So, let's start from here. I think this is what Kalpesh touched upon a bit. From a storage standpoint, you've got various modes on how you can run AeroSpike. You can run AeroSpike completely in memory, which can give you below one millisecond latency. You can use AeroSpike as a hybrid memory architecture where we, where we spoke about where we, you typically store your indexes in RAM and your actual data in SSDs which can give you between 1 to 10 millisecond latency, mostly in the range of about 5 or 6. Or you can run AeroSpike completely on SSDs, even indexes on SSDs, which will still give you about 20, 30 millisecond latency. So depending on the size of your data and depending on your latency requirement, we have an option for all storage models. So we have, if you remember the architecture I showed you, Edge system of record, Typically, our customers run AeroSpike on the edge using hybrid memory architecture, put the cold data or archival data on all flash mode on, a, on a, another AeroSpike cluster. We have customers running 200, 300 terabytes of data in, in that manner. Maybe 10% of data at the edge, rest all in a uh, all flash cluster. Okay, we primarily started off as a key value database, right? Today we have a multi-modal database interface including document, graph, and time series as well. And what we have also invested in is, if you look at the left-hand side, these are all enterprise-grade connectors that we have built, which allows you to either pull data into AeroSpike or push data out of AeroSpike into some other system. So connectors like Kafka, a very widely used connector, Pulsar, JMS, or even stream processing. On the right hand side, you find connectors which allows you to use AeroSpike as a query reporting tool. You can run SQL queries on AeroSpike using our Presto connector. You can run Spark jobs using our Spark connector. And these are all enterprise grade connectors supported by AeroSpike. Some examples of, uh, I spoke about the patents, but some examples of benchmark that we run. This might be of interest to you. So we did a benchmark on Intel uh, machines using AWS where we could reach we, we, we actually did a benchmark for one petabyte of data. Using 20 nodes, we could reach 5 million transactions per second under one millisecond latency. This one is very uh, uh, another interesting use case where HP did a POC for about 13 databases, and they found AeroSpike to be the fastest in terms of amount of data that they could store. So 9 million transactions per second, 100% of time below one millisecond. some statistics of, I see my time is up, so some statistics which uh, you can go through. And finally, there's a list of some of our customers that we have. These are some of our referenceable customers. There's a lot of non-referenceable customers whom we cannot reference, right? So you will see the likes of Flipkart, Geo, Airtel, etc. So with that, I'll end. My time is up. Thank you very much for your audience. Uh, we have a partner booth, by the way, so in case you want to learn more about AeroSpike and use cases, please feel free to drop by a partner booth, right? Thank you. Thank you so much, Abhik.